As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com We are here with attorney Pam Lukashu, a homeschooling and parental rights advocate, and also attorney Deborah Stevenson, who's from the National Home Education Legal Defense. Pam and Deborah, thank you for joining us here to talk about the last bastion of liberty of homeschooling and the rights of parents. We are at the Red Pill Expo 2019, which is in Hartford, Connecticut, hosted by G. Edward Griffin, and you were among a panel of other speakers that, we, that just uh, took place on the main stage, and you talked to us about some very concerning trends that are happening such as agenda 21 and agenda 2030 and also where we have been duped and need to make sure that we look into taking our intrinsic rights in in our own hands and the rights guaranteed by our Constitution before making any compromises that might actually take away some of our parental rights you also talked to us about some of the concerning trends in technology and in our uh, global culture, such as continuous surveillance by artificial intelligence of students in classrooms, for example, starting in China, associated with only exhibiting the correct emotional responses that are approved by the state and as part of their overall system of a social credit score, which can affect all of your liberties in life uh, that can be controlled by the state depending on your communication and who you associate with, etc., and uh, how we can make sure that we don't befall these things as parents here in the U.S. and wanting to retain our liberties. Um, well, I think the most direct attack uh, that we've seen this year is the uh, several bills that were filed across the country in different states that would have required mandatory home visits for children ages birth to three. And those were difficult battles in those states. They got them to dial it back a, a little bit so that they became optional. And they are targeted towards um, people who are defined as at-risk, at-risk parents. Um, often at-risk parents are defined as in the poverty range. So that is, I would say, the most immediate um, attack, and I anticipate that there will be more bills like that. So we need to be alert to them happening. They are proposed as a measure to help, of course. They're just going to help families parent better. They're going to uh, catch a potential abuse before it happens. They're going to help the parents and they're going to make sure that their all their vaccinations are on on course. It all uh, sounds wonderful. It all sounds wonderful. Right. They're, they're going to insert themselves into every aspect of that child's life. So we need to be aware that that is happening. It's not usually on our radar because it's it's not something that we have a lot of uh, I'd say distinct advocacy groups for. So, for instance, Deborah and I work primarily in the homeschool field, but uh, there are not, I don't see as many advocacy groups as parental rights, um, parental protection. That's part of a broader picture that starts with the birth of a child and goes all the way there through their schooling years, and it also deeply affects the health of the family and the relationship of the children with the parents. Melody and I are homeschooled parents of five children all the way through high school and they've all graduated college with honors. And so the rights of the parents as the primary natural educators of their children to choose how their children should be educated is absolutely essential. But you talked in your lectures about how there's an assertion by the state and the government but that to take the parents away from their children and take that right away from them. And in many different examples of separating the role and taking away the natural role of parents uh, from their children. And uh, specifically, it sounds good and if it's going to be supposedly what's the best for the children, but it's serious enough if it's City Hall, but when it becomes the United Nations or some others with some uh, agenda and you'll never know them and you'll never be able to influence their choices, you don't even know who they are in some cases, it can be very chilling. Can you talk to us a little bit about that progression from interfering with schooling and one thing, and then basically interfering with the family and separating 
children from their parents. And also, if you could touch on the unconstitutionality of the interference of the government in educating our children. Well, th there is a myth that homeschooling is something new, and it is absolutely not. Uh, it has always been legal. That's also a myth that it only became legal in the 1980s. It has always been legal because it is one of our unalienable rights to bring up the child and, and educate the child. Um, and that has been since time immemorial. Uh, it has been uh, codified in certain states uh, mm -hmm. in certain ways. Each state has their own um, regulation or not. In Connecticut, we're relatively free to do the educating of our children as we choose and we have fought long and hard to keep that freedom and I think that's what it takes is to be vigilant about what the your rights are where they come from um, and they do come from uh, ourselves we are born with rights um, Declaration of Independence uh, declared that and that was unique in the world at the time we are free to um, do as we choose and we the people have created some government to make sure that we are you know it, it, human nature being what it is we have to have some controls on society and so we created a government and but a limited government and that limited government on the federal level does not include anything to do with parents those are our unalienable rights and the, and the federal government has nothing to do with them and that's what we should maintain um, if at all possible. The states, on the other hand, have intruded on our rights, but again, we the people created the state government, and if we <laughs> allow the state government to make those rules and those regulations and pass those laws, then it's up to us, if we don't like them, to take back that freedom and to uh, vote them out or educate them so that they won't do that. Um, and But that takes us. That's That's what our system is. We have the power to do um, that which we need to do to protect our unalienable rights, and right. we should be doing that. Yes, I agree, and I think one of the things that was powerful experience for uh, my husband, Dunnigan, and I was in one state we were in, we had a very vocal homeschooling organization, and so we were very free to do a lot of what we needed to do to educate our children. Moving, having to move to another state, found that there was less of an organization mm -hmm. and we had less rights. So I really agree with what you're saying, mm -hmm. Deborah, is that we do need to get together so if people are planning on homeschooling, they really need to try to form groups so that they can, um, uh, the word, Advocacy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Advocate. And also petition our, when, when we see laws that are trying to come onto the books. And mm -hmm. in the one state we were in, they were very active saying, please call your senator, please mm -hmm. call your representative, mm -hmm. and and don't have this passed so that our, we're not restricted. I think that's an extremely good point. But, but it's also important not to rely on organizations. It's uh, it, You have to rely on your own ability to discern what the law is and what it isn't. That may be tedious. It may be... Um, you know, um, uncomfortable, but that's as a parent, that's part of you. If you want to retain your right to educate your child in your own fashion, you need to do that and not believe everybody else. You need to make sure you know the law, you know, you know how to look up the law, what your rights are, so that you can not be duped by anyone, by the government official or that says the law is this, or by an organization that says we're here to help you, or by any attorney or anybody else, any even homeschool organization, you know, locally. So you have to make those decisions on your own. Each parent needs to, to take that responsibility on along with educating their child. Well, I'll claim that we've been in a multi-generational dumbing down not only of our students, but of the parents, forgetting what, as you said, homeschooling was since time began, the original way and the ordinary way, not the exception. So it's not something new, as you point out, but most parents today, we've never been told, and they, don't, they didn't grow up that way. They saw people being publicly educated only, and they feel rather overwhelmed at the thought of, how, they, how can I ever manage this? Rather than actually realizing that it's been the norm for generations, uncountable. But secondly, the second reason they're feeling overwhelmed is how can they... Not only can they homeschool in the first place, but if they really thought they have to become legal experts to go up against city hall or the state government, it can be doubly overwhelming. So you're there to say that you really can do this. You really can understand what the laws are in your state. And, and there's an example of a place where they can go and actually find out what the laws are with confidence and make it through that and get enough confidence that they can say, okay, I've got that under my belt. Now I can move along to actually doing this homeschooling thing.
it's far easier today to find that out than it was years ago. And I can tell you that when I started this journey, I was not an attorney. I was a mom, just like your mom. And um, there came a time when uh, there was some threat to our right to do this. And as a mom, I spoke to another mom and said, what's going on? And this other mom was going to write a letter to somebody, and I'm like, well, why? What about? Etc. It's because you don't know. And as a mom, I started getting information, and the government official would say, or the writing in, in the whatever letter would say, well, this is the law, and they'd quote part of it, and then dot, 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 and quote another part of it, and say, you have to do this. And I'm like, okay, well, why? And so then I began to look up what the law actually said. And when you read the entire law, mm -hmm. it didn't say that at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, the important part they left out made it, it was completely the mm -hmm. opposite. Mm -hmm. So that's when I began to think, okay. And then I looked around. Oh, what I look around for? A lawyer or whatever, somebody help, a group, whatever. And there wasn't any at the mm -hmm. time that would help or would do anything. And so I looked around and said, well, I guess I have to do it then. And as a mom, then that's what, how it started. And then you join with other people, you, you know, provide in information to each other, you communicate, and then you do what you have to do as a mom. Because it's no different than if your, mom, if your child were threatened by anything else. You as a mom are going to protect that child and do whatever you can. It's easier today because all you have to do is go to your computer and uh, to look up the laws. Every state now has its own website and on the website the three branches are there and the legislative branch is where you start. Another way to look up the law is to go to the law library at the local um, law school or at each, each courthouse it usually has a law library and you ask the reference librarian there where to start and or you can just Google it online. I'm sorry, I shouldn't use Google. <laughs> but you, you, you should, yes, DuckDuckGo or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, it's easier to do that today and look up the law. And then this is common sense. The law is supposed to be written so the common person can understand it. Now, that's a whole other subject I could get into. But uh, if you don't understand it, then you need to just c communicate with another human being to try to figure it out yourself and do the critical thinking because if you ask a government official they're going to tell you what they think it is. Mm -hmm. Another source we encountered was the Homeschool Legal Defense Association hslda.org and they have little extracts of every law from all 50 states so you can get a quick overview of what the homeschooling laws are in your state but you're saying not to trust organizations like that? Well what I'm saying is uh, not to trust me when I say what the law is, not to trust any other organization but to look it up for yourself because everyone can make mistakes mm. and what you're looking for may not be on whatever website. Mm -hmm. Okay, So you have to look at the original sources just like you have to look at the Declaration of Independence, you have to look at the Constitution, you have to look at actual the actual laws, not what somebody says the law is. Okay, Not a compilation, not somebody, not an attorney, nobody. You have to look it up yourself and read it to see what it actually says. Easy for an attorney to say. <laughs> well, I was a mom when yeah, I started. I, I, I kind of agree with Deborah. Eventually, I agree with Deborah. Because I work for a state organization that has a website that explains what the laws are in Connecticut. And Deborah works with another organization statewide as well that also explains what the laws are. Her own organization explains what the laws are about homeschooling. And my organization also works with HSLDA and we've specifically worked with them on um, a statement of the law of what homeschooling is in Connecticut because it's complicated um, because of the story of how we got to where we are. Um, but I, I still think that our organizations are a good place for a homeschooling parent to start to get an idea of what the law is. Most states, I work with um, state homeschool leaders around the country and most states have some form of statewide homeschool organization that does what we do. They're a good resource. It's kind of like uh, you want to study the history of something and what one of my favorite ways to research is to read a children's book first because it gives me a broad overview and then I can go in and pick what else I want to look at. 
And I also understand Deborah's point about saying, eventually, in order to have the confidence to advocate for yourself, and it's going to take all of us, not just Deborah and not just me, it's going to take the actions of individual parents. And the more you actually understand your own state statute or your own law governing uh, homeschooling, parental rights, etc., the more confident you will be in your ability to talk to your legislator and educate them and fight for your rights. We, we just had that uh, happen in Connecticut this year. We had a bill that would have changed homeschooling law substantially and our organizations did send out alerts to our members and so we had over 100 people, hundreds of people show up at the Capitol, parents who came in to testify and as a result the threatening sections of the proposed bill were removed before the vote. So, but and again, um, I agree that it takes co coordination when mm -hmm. threats happen, mm -hmm. but it really does take, and that's what NHELD, my organization, National Home Education Legal Defense, has, has always sought to do, is to tell parents, you're not always going to have a, a lawyer with you. You're not mm -hmm. always going to have an organization yep. in your state. You move to state to state. The organizations are different from mm -hmm. time to time, yeah. different people on them. So you really need to... My group is about empowering uh, individuals mm. to do what they can on their own. Mm -hmm. There's always help out there, but it's really important so you know your own rights and so you can advocate for yourself and you can start the group that you want in, in the state if you need it. Gives you enough confidence to go back to law school, huh? That's true. <laughs> right. I think, the, I think, gosh, both really good points of needing to do a lot of work individually, but also maybe forming some groups. So, Because as a collective group, we can do more at the government level mm -hmm. to try to not um, let the government be so intrusive on, on our inalienable rights to homeschool, to teach our children. I think both are great. Yeah, there's strength in numbers that comes when it, to influencing those tipping points where certain legislators may be uninformed and it helps to have the strength of numbers to make them realize that it's there's a lot of voices speaking out and uh, and really need to really watch out for the rights of parents. Deborah, you mentioned something that's very sinister, but it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing where there are many good organizations that are, that are bringing forth good sounding bills or good sounding uh, proposals to make this change, to put in this compromise, put in this documentation that amends the Constitution to protect parents' rights. But what can be tricky about that we need to watch for, watch out for? Well, it depends on um, the agenda of the organization. It depends on the goals. Um, and it depends on whether the organization realizes and thinks things through long enough to see the ramifications down the road. So um, one can be duped unintentionally, one can be duped intentionally, um, but again, that, that all goes to, to looking at things yourself and thinking critically about the issue down the road and what the ramifications are. If something sounds good, it may be very good, but it may have very um, long-range complications down the road that are not going to be good for you. So that's that's what I mean by each individual has to think for themselves because, and it, it's true with anything, anybody can tell you, well, let's do it this way, but if you don't think for yourself and say, well, if I do that that way, what can happen? And, and, and think of those complications down the road and then make a decision knowing all the facts that you can possibly get at the time. And I think that's, that's really important, especially today when you see it in government and everywhere else. People are say, always saying, well, let's call this bill X, Y, and Z. That sounds so good. And it actually does the opposite. Yes. And, and organizations can do that too. Anyone can do that to you. You gave an example of how parental rights can be tricky depending on how it's expressed. It can be like taking away something that you already have. Can you explain that to us? Well, it, it, if we're talking about the federal government, um, Article 1, Section 8 of, of the Constitution gives, we have given some of our powers and some of our rights up to the federal government to protect so we can have all of our rights protected. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution grants to the federal government, to Congress in particular, certain rights and powers. But it does not grant to the federal government anything to do with education or with parental rights or with children. That is part of 
according to the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, rights and powers that we have retained for the states and for the people. So anytime the federal government wants to say to you, um, whether it's an education law, pass an education law, well, how do they do that? They do that by using the taxing and spending power, not a direct regulation of education. The state has to accept money or whatever is being offered by the federal government mm -hmm. in exchange for doing X, Y, and Z. And that's how you get education laws implemented in the states. It's the states that actually adopt the laws that the federal government wants it to adopt in order to get the money. But there is no direct right to regulate parents or children at the moment. And unless parents and children accept a benefit from the government and then there come strings attached. So that you have to be aware of those things and people are not taught that anymore. So having a federal law to protect parents' rights sounds good until you think it through and you said... That's right, because if, if, you, if you change the Constitution, now you're giving the federal government the right to have a say over pr parents and children. And if, even, if it's, even if they want to do it beneficially to protect parents and children, what will be the long-term consequence of that? How do you protect parents and children? If you have the authority of the federal government, how would you do that? Well, you'd, you sh you'd have to set up a state, a, a federal agency to do that. And what would that agency look like? Who protects, supposedly, um, parents and children in the state, on the state level? That would be a Department of Children and Families or a CPS, can, you know, uh, kind of agency. And do you really want a federal agency having anything to do with parents and children? Because how much can you actually influence a state Department of Children, Families, or uh, Child Protection Services. You really can't. That's a difficult job enough, but how would you do that on a federal level? So that's, that gets complicated. Yeah. There, there, is another, an, there is another side to the issue of whether or not we need a parental rights amendment at the federal level. Um, so the other argument is that, um, and I understand that the potential danger of opening up our Constitution to amend it um, even if you do it with the stated purpose of a limited, um, limited subject. However, I also understand the argument for a parental rights amendment, which is that it wouldn't necessarily set up a federal agency. We don't have agencies set up to preserve our Fourth Amendment rights. It's embedded in our laws and, and um, administered by our courts. But the parental rights amendment is arguably similar to one of our Bill of Rights, like the Fourth Amendment right. And the reason that those who promote the PRA do so is because they are seeing the U.S. courts um, interpret our laws, this is going to be a surprise after my talk, according to international law. Um, international law should not be a part of our legal decisions, but they're looking outside the country instead of to our own laws. And so no, they're sorry, saying... I'm sorry to interrupt you, sure. but I wanted to, since you're talking about that, the, the you spoke today um, at the Red Pill Expo on mm -hmm. the UN Agenda 21 and yes. the um, UN Agenda for 2030. Yes. So if we could touch on that while you're touching on this important topic too because that's even more, that's globally how yes. they want to run yes. the United States. So Absolutely. And so we see it as it touches on parental rights. In fact, it happened in Connecticut when I was, uh, when I first became involved in helping out homeschool organizations. There was a state uh, senator who wanted, who proposed a bill that would have made Connecticut um, determine all child policy, all laws on ch affecting child policy according to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is truly frightening. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is a separate document from Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, but it gives uh, the children rights and instills the rights directly in the children instead of the parent making those decisions until the child is legally competent to do so. So if the, if the child still really is having a difficult time making those choices, then who is going to make the choice for them? And the answer is someone else, not the parent, the state. And that's where we are headed with things like the UN Agenda 21 and 2030, specifically 2030 Sustainable Development Goals 4.7, 
uh, states that eventually by 2030, all learners will understand sustainable development, not only understand it, but will promote it. And that part of sustainable development and sustainability encompass human rights, global citizenship, gender equality. I have no idea how this really ties into sustainable development um, until you get to some of the other statements which explain that in order to sustain our life and sustain our earth that maybe some people are less sustainable than others. For instance, those who are highly educated. And that's when I talked about the, the Pogo poster that from Walt Kelly back in 1970 for Earth Day that said, we've met the enemy and he is us. That really spells out the nihilistic view of the UN agenda. And they're incorporating that more and more into our schools. I'll bet you anything that uh, parents of a public school child today will have heard some of these buzzwords used. I agree that the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and Agenda 21 and Agenda 30 are terrible things. However, there is um, the, the, the solution to international influence is not changing our Constitution. It really, it, there are much better ways to, do, to deal with that. One, for the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, again, that would be a treaty. Treaties have to be ratified by two-thirds of the Senate easier to, to change the minds of 34 senators to, mm -hmm. to squash that than to change our Constitution to grant a federal government uh, powers that they never had before. So, you know, there, is, there, there are two different points of view, right, right. but that's the position that, that we have taken. Mm -hmm. One thing that we haven't talked on yet, but was quite unsettling in your talks, it came out in your talks on the main stage, was about the trends partly based on technology and partly based on a kind of evolutionary approach to social norms and about social engineering and social and emotional learning uh, prescriptions and about how like the China Sesame credit, social credit score and also how like Facebook and Google in the US are kind of participating in that. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this goes beyond the education system and goes about conforming our thoughts and our behavior and our conduct based on external external sorts of pressures and how the decisions are being made outside of ourselves. Yes, we're not educating our children anymore just about how to do math or how to read. We are educating them about how to feel. There's a lot of focus on emotional uh, development, on what is, what is considered a good emotional practice, whether or not you're being respectful, whether or not you can be uh, sympathetic, those kinds of things. And of course, when you start defining emotions, who's doing the defining? And those emotions are always being assessed and read via the social and emotional programming. If it is at the younger ages, it's being done by the, the, the teachers but in the upper grades where a lot of the curriculum is done online it's really embedded in every subject so the data that is being captured is um, being assessed all the time about how someone feels not only about how the student feels but about how the parent feels as well how the, how the family feels what's going on in your home what do, how do mom and dad feel about xyz and you see that's where you see these really bizarre quizzes pop up like the one in Ohio, the, the teacher who uh, as a result of the uproar of the morality quiz she administered decided to resign rather than face public scrutiny. And how are we seeing that play out with artificial intelligence and other things on a grand scale affecting other things in our life? Like we're always worried about our credit scores in the U.S. Yes. What is this social credit score we're seeing evidence of in China, and what are the analogies of that forming in our country? The social credit score in China is used to manipulate and control people's behavior. And it's done not so much with a heavy stick, but through our natural human tendency to want to be accepted. Um, and the, there is a heavy stick as well, because if you have a low social credit score in China, 
it will restrict your ability to take out loans to be able to stay in an upper class hotel um, specifically for travel millions of Chinese in the past year have been denied the ability to get on a plane and travel and the scoring system is a part of the technology as someone was explaining to me today after the talk where they can um, because they have a lot of, of facial recognition surveillance in their smart cities so people are literally being watched all the time and and tracked so someone uh, who has a low social credit score they can notify the other people in an area that they're near someone with a low social credit score so that that person can essentially be shunned and they interviewed a Chinese man who who'd seen his own score go down because he'd given a loan to his friend and his friend had a low social credit score and so the way that he was building it back up was to pay money and he was he was working very hard to save money and keep on paying I, I don't know what his how much more he had to pay to bring it back up to the level where he was before but as a result of his association with his low score friend he had uh, not been able to fly he had to get in uh, do travel by bus and that kind of thing it was uh, very inconvenient and yet he would learned his lesson and he spoke in favor of the system this is a multi-headed beast because it's playing on our human nature to be concerned about sort of tribal belonging and it's short-circuiting our ability to use logic and yeah. reason and to think critically. As you were describing, it's so important for parents to be able to do, instead of appealing to emotion, we've certainly seen that playing out in the millennial snowflake and other phenomena of recent years. You know, when people are rioting after an election because they don't like the outcome, and you're supposed to be sympathetic with them because they're upset, so we're providing safe spaces on campuses. This deconstruction of thinking seems like it's a, uh, attacking multiple facets of us, and the surveillance you mentioned, you're talking about even students in the classrooms being continuously surveilled for facial recognition. Yes. In China, the, the facial recognition software scans the faces of the classroom students every 30 seconds and is able to identify six emotions. That's part of the AI that will be developed here in the U.S. as well. Right now, facial recognition software, as it's being rolled out in the United States, is to specifically identify the individual. So it's promoted as a way to enhance school security. In the Texas school where it was uh, brought in, and then in the New York school as well, they say, well, it's going to be able to identify someone who is on the list of people who shouldn't be in school, either because they've been banned or because they're on a terrorist watch list or because they're walking into school with a gun. Um, they have not answered the questions about what happens if they're wearing a mask over their face. Um, well, that it, just a mask might tip them off. You don't know. Uh, but how long will it take the police to get there once they notify the system? We have been speaking with attorney Pam Lukashu, a homeschool and parenting rights advocate, and attorney Deborah Stevenson from National Homeschool Legal Defense at the Red Pill Expo. We just wanted to say thank you. And if you're interested in hearing more of their talks that they gave at the Red Pill Expo, you can join the Red Pill University. And I think, Pam, you said it's about $25 a month, and you'll get the whole Red Pill Expo uh, speakers from the current and previous years. And uh, you can access the archives. Yes, yeah, you can access the archives of the videos. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Oh, this thank you wonderful. very much. Wonderful. It was very nice to meet you and be able to talk to you. What if gold or silver drop in price after I order it? Well, everything fluctuates with time, but nothing has held up longer and better than gold and silver throughout all the changes that have happened in history. Your first ounce of silver is at spot price and you get free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com slash rp. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month. Signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.